welcome friends, friends, students, dear colleagues. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome you. And after that, a huge welcome to dear Natalie Puni. I'm sorry, Natalie, I forgot your second uh, surname. <laughs> And then that's fine. I use Huni for for okay, work. Yeah. For like work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, welcome to Med Talks. So um, some we have some students that are for first years here. So briefly, Med Talks is a, actually an initiative. Of course, it's a, inspired by TED Talks, and it's an initiative that uh, Metropolitan University organizes uh, with the aim to give all of you guys, our students, the chance to meet and greet professionals from different domains and with a variety of different backgrounds in order to have a cool energy flow, you know, between both sides, of course, and to have a, a positive experience. Of course, some, some talks will have can be realized in our in our classrooms at the university some of them even if it wasn't this situation Natalie wouldn't be able to to really be here with us like live face to face but that's no problem and it's a really positive outcome the last years because um lots of these professionals and pioneers like like Natalie is they also like to talk to you guys the younger the energy the better and um when we're talking about design and uh, focus on, on the, the domain of design and uh, design professionals. We had a lot of people from different studios and really great designers that met some of our students. Now they're working together or working do, together at different projects. So it's, it's a very nice flow between uh, both sides. And before all, we believe that this format of communication with pioneers, as I said, like Natalie, leave a really, unforgettable experience and effects on students, and especially when we're so lucky to hear it personally from the side of the individual in focus. So today we have the immense pleasure to welcome Natalie Huni. Natalie is with us all the way from New York live right now. And I, for one, can say that we feel very lucky um, that Natalie have Found, found time to chat with us because I, I know her, I can imagine her schedule actually. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not gonna be inappropriate to talk, to start to talk about Natalie's background. I think uh, we're all very excited and we've been waiting uh, a couple of weeks to hear it uh, personally from her. So um, Natalie's gonna soon start with the dirty details of her, of her professional life. And before all, I would like to, really um, motivate all of you guys to be, um, you know, to be totally free and feel free to, you know, be interactive. That is the whole point. Natalie's gonna say probably the same thing, but, um, you know, be relaxed, be cool, and, you know, use this really, really once in a lifetime uh, experience to talk to someone like Natalie. So here you go, the mic is passed to, to Natalie. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm, uh, I don't know if you hear, but there's like a lot of noise in my background. Um, I'm actually, I'm in New York, but I'm actually based in Brooklyn. And there's a bad timing, but there's a huge construction beside my window. So hopefully, let me know if you can't hear me. I'm going to try to speak. Oh, it's great. It's great. Yeah. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm super excited to be here. I have a, I put together a presentation for you. And as Maggie said, I, I hope it, you know, like stop me at any time. This is very casual. Ask me questions. Um, I have a little bit of time at the end um, if we want to talk through anything. But um, this is really like my experience, my point of view. You know, you, you would talk to, uh, I, I, I would imagine, a number of different people. They would have probably different things to tell you. But this is really sort of from my point of view. So let me try to share my screen. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to, that. Let me know if. Ah, cool. You can see this. Yep. Works. Oh. You can see this, right, Maggie? Yep, yep. He's dancing. <laughs> dancing, dancing, yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm calling this finding joy in advertising and design. It's something I, like personally having gone through, you know, so much um, through my career, um, taking a step back, finding joy in sort of like the process of everything we're, we're doing. Um, and uh, the work we're doing, the creative work, is something that's really, really important because sometimes we, we forget. Um, you know, we're so focused on like the next step, the next thing we need to do. 
um, but the, the sort of the the journey, the full journey should should you know just something to keep in mind um, that it should be something that is enjoyable too. So, um, you know, what are we going to talk about today? I'll give you a little bit, a very quick uh, background about me and my my story and what I've I've gone through, and then I've sort of uh, chapter this into like three areas, the beginning, you know, finding a job, um, and especially finding a job that you don't hate <laughs> is something really important. Um, the middle, which is basically, I guess, like the couple of years where you've started working, uh, you're in an agency, a design studio, whatever it is, you know, and how to make the most of that sort of that moment in time. And then, you know, sort of what I call at the top, which is you know more at the end of your uh, professional journey where i feel like i'm towards where i'm at right now um and sort of being able to look back and uh, and enjoying and learning you know sort of like all the the lessons uh, that you've learned and and what else what happens after that right and then this section where it's you know you can ask me anything um and at any moment really um so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about myself. My name is Natalie Cuny. I, um, you know, I'm many things. I am a designer. I'm also an art director, which are two sort of a little bit different things. Um, designer comes from sort of really the craft of design um, and problem solving and sort of systematic thinking. Art direction comes from more from sort of my work in the advertising space, you know, crafting beautiful um, experiences through, you know, uh, working with photographers and directors. So it's a little different, um, but I am a little bit of both, right? Um, and right now I'm heading uh, design for North America. So multiple offices in the US, um, in New York, Atlanta, Boston, Detroit. I have a, a, a wide team. Uh, I work with uh, day to day. Um, and um, yeah, it's a, it's a really great experience. It's uh, a huge role, which is probably one of the biggest roles I've had um, and up until now. So I like to sort of put these numbers on the slide. It sort of helps me organize and structure a little bit of my story. So I've been, you know, I've been working for over 25 years, which, you know, makes me like really old. <laughs> uh, but I like this number. 25 years feels like, you know, I, I, I've gone through a lot. I've experienced so many things and um, and I feel that like at, at 25 years, or I call it a quarter of a century, um, I've seen change in the industry um, and I've moved with change and, and learned, kept in learning and evolving. So that, that, that is for me, like 25 years of like really rich experiences. I've worked across five agency models. Um, and this is, I, I think, a little bit unique. A lot of uh, sort of creatives you know, decide to go straight into design and sort of work their way um, sort of in a, in a vertical. I have made the sort of the conscious choice of trying different types of agency models. So that's design agency, uh, products and services, you know, um, more towards geared towards like building uh, platforms and, and services, apps and products, that sort of thing. I've worked in experiential, which is really working with like physical spaces and creating experiences for consumers. I worked in sort of digital advertising and I worked in traditional advertising. So really making films and telling stories. Um, and I've, I've moved from one agency model to the, to the next. And I think one of the main reasons is I was just like very curious, you know, I would see friends of mine in the industry working on something different. And I was like, I want to learn about what, what, what it is you're doing. I want to, I want to, you know, I'm curious about uh, that sort of craft or that skill set. Um, I've, I've worked uh, in four different countries, um, and I think that's probably part of, you know, just my general curiosity. I think as creative, as designer, we're always look, you know, curious about, you know, what's happening um, elsewhere. And it, in the beginning, when I started working, I, I studied uh, college in Paris, and I worked there for a number of years, and I thought, how am I going to be able to, like, I'm dreaming of, like, working in the US or working elsewhere, how am I going to do that? Um, the, the, the hardest shift was the first shift. I was able to get a job in London, you know, it wasn't that far from where I was in Paris. But uh, opening up that sort of international experience for me opened up a lot of doors. Um, and then the other, you know, uh, the other movements uh, were so much easier because I had done that first um, that's for shift. So happy to, you know, if any of you are interested in that, happy to 
to uh, talk about how I, I was able to do that um, and how I was able to continue doing that. Uh, I've won, just, I, I stopped counting, but I've won a bunch of international awards. It's not so much that the awards are important. Um, you know, of course, they're, you know, you're always so proud to be um, recognized internationally. Uh, I think for a career, um, it is important. It's a sort of, for me, two things. One, it's a, a checkpoint that, you know, uh, I validation, I guess, from the industry that, you know, the work you've done has uh, been judged by like an independent panel of uh, creatives and, you know, been rewarded on craft and on sort of, um, you know, the strategy behind it. It's also a really good tool for anybody who wants to uh, work abroad to have awards. So again, as I was, you know, wanting to move, continue moving, it's something I strive uh, to continue getting um, because it sort of reinforced my value as a, as a creative. And then the fourth number, which I'm really proud of, I, I have for kids and often women ask me and younger women ask me like, how, how do you do it? Like, is it possible? There's a, you know, when I started out, um, you know, a number of years ago, I, I always had sort of male uh, bosses or mentors. I didn't see a lot of women in the industry. And I had my first kid when I was 26 um, and I was, you know, a struggling uh, sort of mid-level art director. And um, it, it didn't stop me from, you know, uh, moving forward. My career was definitely not, uh, you know, it was not easy for sure, but it was not something that, you know, I had, I felt like I had to choose one or the other and it's something that you know um i as i move forward i've seen and i have many conversations with sort of young women in the industry um but also guys you know who ask me like is it possible i, I i'm dreaming of having kids like is it possible is it compatible with a, a career in this field which is like super demanding and you know it's not easy i think it makes you um stronger uh, it also makes you more empathetic towards the people you work with. It just makes you a better, more, more rounded person. So yes, it's, it's tough. Um, it's absolutely possible. And I'm you know, happy to answer <laughs> any questions um, about that as we move forward. So I, I have this sort of a, a spread of some of the clients I've worked with across like different countries. And I would say like my, my experience working with brands really, again, you know, I told you I I've worked across like a, a number of like agency models, which means I've worked across uh, a number of uh, types of, uh, you know, experiences and design uh, projects um, ranging, you know, from like sports with Adidas, um, you know, social digital campaigns. I have worked on relaunching a fashion brand like Marc Jacobs. I'll show you some examples online of what I've done um, to relaunch sort of their, their dying brand online and make their sort of e-com uh, store, their number one store uh, worldwide. Um, and brands, you know, uh, that are, have like sort of technology integrated within um, uh, their DNA, like YouTube or um, Nokia. Well, back in the days, Nokia was much more <laughs> sort of an innovative brand than it is today, uh, but very wide range of clients. Um, and so what I, what I like to sort of, uh, if I simplify what I what I what I have to offer, I often say that I connect the dots between art and design. Again, you know, I have this broad experience between like art direction on advertising and design and systematic thinking um, uh, on other projects. And um, because I've moved around a lot, um, I I can sort of say that my my professional experience is uh parallel to a consumer journey right if you think of a consumer at the beginning of a journey discovering um a product uh, from the actual product maybe the experience they have in store an ad they see online and all the way to like purchase uh whether it's online or, or in retail um i've worked across the whole journey as a creative a designer and art director um so i say i i connect the dots between art and design across this like full consumer journey um, and at the core of that, you know, the, the thing I'm, I personally am the most passionate about is as a designer, as a creative, as somebody who like li likes to craft beautiful experiences, the, the elevation of the craft in the work, um, you know, is uh, something that sort of uh, connects people 
really emotionally, um, it's something important, this emotional aspect of the work that I, I'm trying to create. Um, and then additional layer of that, I, I, I love to work with uh, innovation and technology. So art and technology sort of paired together to create sort of uh, more emotional uh, experiences. So this is one of the sort of the uh, important projects I've worked on. Um, and this was in 2006, you know, this is before the, the first iPhone was ever launched. So it feels a little dated, but I think I still think it's, it's such a beautiful concept and project. Um, it was for Nokia, it's called Nokia uh, Vine. It, it's really a concept that sort of strings together uh, stories um, that people shared, you know, through media, photography, uh, video, um, music. Um, it strings them together um, through this Vine. And um, what's interesting here, you know, we, we created sort of the, the experience, the online experience of like discovering stories that connect people through this, this um, physical Vine. But the, the design system we put in place uh, on the vine with these like leaf shapes, which uh, held all of the content, was also a design element that we that was uh, developed for uh, the interface on um, on the mobile uh, phone, right? So, uh, you know, I like to say that the the branding was the interface, and the interface and the experience was also part of the branding and. You know, this was such a beautiful project. It won, you know, gold at Cannes, which was all, which is always a good, good thing to have. Uh, but again, like just to fr uh, uh, frame it, again, 2006, way before the first iPhone. Um, oh, Instagram actually um, stole <laughs> your idea totally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like um, this is a, a project I, I worked on two years ago. I got the chance to work on this amazing project for the relaunch of the fashion brand uh, Marc Jacobs. And I, I think about how they show up online as sort of an e-commerce experience, um, and try to capture sort of the excitement of the brand. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, a brand where sort of the the personality of, of Mark Jacob, the, the sort of the designer, really is infused in everything um, they do and the products. Um, his like love for details, but also he he really mixes like high end uh, fashion and sort of low low end in this uh, very playful uh, brand. So, you know, we, we worked the, the how we discover products on, on the site, um, you know, animation also looked at um, how people sort of can interact with uh, the, the product experience and like mi mixing and matching different outfits on this like interactive um, uh, sort of uh, screen online. And then we had this really cool uh, idea. It actually didn't launch, but they they were really thinking of doing it. it but it's the, the repurposing the the uh, store windows, right? Uh, we call it the after hours shop. And the concept behind that was that when the actual stores were closed, right? They closed at like 8 p.m. at night and reopened at uh, 10 a.m. the next morning. The, the, the window shops would open, right? So we had this neon sign where it says, the after hour shop is open where people could come in um, they would be sort of geolocated with their mobile phones and they could only purchase if they were physically in front of the window and they would get access to the sort of like unique pieces like this um this t-shirt with this uh, like um robotic arm that would that would sort of print the exact time they would purchase this like unique one-of-a-kind sort of um, um t-shirt right um, and, and the reason before the, the, behind sort of creating this sort of experience, um, this uh, like mobile experience um, and shopping experience is just to create a little bit of tension in the brand so that people would be like, hey, have you heard of this like, uh, you know, cool experience, um, create a little bit of, you know, excitement about the relaunch of the store through. So this is sort of more like a PR activation. It's a one off kind of um, experience that, that could be launched. Um, this other project uh, for OPI, so OPI, you know, the nail polish, it's the, it's a brand that has, I think, the most uh, wide number of colors, um, you know, sort of in their, in their books. Um, and with the, the colors, we create this concept of, you know, the color is uh, the universal language that sort of transcends all, all countries and frontiers. And we created an alphabet uh, where each color was a letter. And with this alphabet, we were able to sort of write these beautiful coded um, messages that would appear um, in their in their ads, right? So uh, you would imagine these uh, ads in the subway. We had a couple of 
um, uh, sort of print ads and magazines. And, and the experience was paired with a mobile phone that would, um, an app that would sort of scan uh, the colors and sort of translate the colors into letters and people could sort of send messages and, and put a letter. So it was, again, like a very simple idea and concept around uh, color. You know, obviously everything is about, um, you know, pushing and, and having people discover the range of colors through this like beautiful experience. And ultimately, of course, you know, we're not living in a vacuum. Um, each drop can push you to, to sort of purchase that color or purchase, you know, sort of the colors that, uh, that make up this message. Um, so that's, you know, again, like very quickly, a little, like a snapshot of like what, what I've been doing, you know, my story. And, and so I want to start with uh, the beginning of your journey, you know, your maybe in first, first year, second year, fourth year, you know, wherever you're at. But the first thing that's going to happen when you, um, you know, leave college is you're going to start finding um, a job, a role in a studio, an agency, you know, where, where, wherever you know fits whatever you're 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 doing. So the important thing is landing a job that you don't absolutely hate. It's really it's really hard to find um, to find the right place that's going to fit. And I think you know when you when you get out of school, you're not exactly sure what you're going to do you know you have sort of foundational creative foundations um but i would say the your your discovery of your journey really starts the day you, you start your new job right so how do you do that um you know you could go through the route of like sending emails to you know maybe people you know creative directors or recruiters or they're con contacting uh, you know agencies directly it will be a little frustrating i just want to give you a heads up these people are very very busy and they might not answer your emails right away so i'm going to give you a snapshot of my inbox it's not it's not pretty this is how many unread emails i have Twelve thousand four hundred and twenty nine. that's a huge number because I receive so many, I have so much spam. I have so the time just just put yourself in in the other person's shoes. Um, you know, some people are more organized than others. I just I receive like a ton of stuff. So I think the frustration of you know sending out sort of cold emails to um, agencies or studios, not hearing back, just give it a little bit of time. You know, people are going to sort through. Um, it's not that they're necessarily uninterested. It's just that there is so much happening and there's always a fire happening somewhere on a project. Um, so just again, like keep it in mind. It's not, it, it's not necessarily you, but um, it's, it's a little bit of a jungle out there. Five seconds. So let's say you get a, you send an email with your portfolio and um, you know, a director, creative director, recruiter clicks on the link. You have five seconds to make an impression. That is how short the time is, given how many uh, portfolios have received. So I, I'm going to take you through like what I think are the like uh, little tips and tricks of how to make these like five seconds count the most, right? So let's just start with like your portfolio grid. Um, let's say this is this is your grid, um, and I've highlighted up here uh, sort of four projects. We're going to click on the first four projects. Well, first of all, we're going to take five seconds to look at the grid and say, is it worth um, pushing further, pushing forward, right? Um, and I can tell you from experience, uh, I can tell right away in less, even less than five seconds, if the work is going to um, talk to me, if it's something I want to pursue looking at, right? Our time's pretty. Uh, precious. Uh, so just think of your grid, you know, as your storefront, this is what you're selling yourself, your work, your creativity. It's better to put less projects than more. So like a good number would be six, nine, if you really have a lot of work. Uh, but six feels like a good number, I think, out of school. Um, and it should be your six strongest pieces of work, right? And organize them by strength, like put the best, the best one, the first one, because this is the one they're going to click on first, et cetera, and sort of rearrange them uh, that way. Um, 
quite a short range of work. So if you're, you know, good in typography, good in illustration, like try to show that range in these first four projects um, so that we can see, you know, I think, especially coming out of school, I think most sort of professional creatives always think um, that you, you know, you still have a lot to learn. Like, to be honest, you have the foundations, you, you know, um, but so we want to know, like, what are some of the tools that you have in your arsenal that we can work with, right? We can continue to develop with you as we're working with you. Uh, I would recommend just a simple and really clean grid. Um, I've seen portfolios where the portfolio itself is a creation and it just, it, it creates a lot of uh, noise and it makes it really hard to see the actual work itself. So, you know, either white background, black background, just keep it like super, super simple. And gifts are always a nice to have, you know, if, especially if you want to attract your eye to one project in particular, having these little vignettes uh, that show a little bit more what's behind it um, are good things to have to, I wouldn't put gifts everywhere because then, you know, everything's like blinking, uh, but just like, you know, find the right balance um, so that this, this page sort of works harder for you. The about section is also super, super important. Um, we want to keep it short. It has to be like super clear what you have to offer. So if you are a designer, say you're a designer, if you are, you know, more UI, more UX, uh, write that in so that we don't have to, um, analyze and you know sort of uh guess what it is i've seen so many portfolios where i read the about page like three times and I'm like i still don't know if this is a writer an art director a designer like i don't know what this person is doing um a little splash of tone like tone of voice you know just to show your personality i think it's always a good to have uh, this is the page where people you know the, the creatives are going to look to see if they like you it's the first approach. And so a little bit of a something to show, you know, uh, something you like, something some, something about your personality. Um, uh, you know, chemistry is so important. Uh, people wanna work with people they, 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 you know, they feel like they're gonna want to spend the day with, right? This example here, like art director by day, good ideas come at night, embrace failure, think wrong, do it now, apologize later. Like this is somebody I actually hired uh, recently. I, and I like this write up because it felt very honest. You know, he didn't oversell himself. Um, I like the idea of embracing failure because often, you know, often sometimes people oversell themselves and like say how amazing they are and you don't see a glimmer of like a, a humanity. And we're all people, you know, like, I like the fact that he's, he is open to say that, you know, he tries, he tries different things. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. And then own your story. This is something I learned, like, we're so, so late in life. No, nobody ever told me this, but your story is important. And, and starting to write a little bit about your story um, in your write-up and then developing that when you have an interview is so important. Again, like, I've done so many interviews where, um people's i remember people who have an interesting story to tell right Every, remember everybody loves hearing stories as a kid as kids we loved hearing stories and so when you present yourself you have to say it as a so you have to find an angle that makes you special it can be something very simple i'll give you an example i had this girl she you know she's american i've, I've interviewed so many americans and they all had the same story they're in college they wanted to work in, you know, advertising or design, and then there was nothing that stood out. But this one girl, I remember, she told me she uh, did a course and she did one year in Sweden, and she told me how scared she was to go there because she, you know, she had never traveled outside of the U.S. and she, you know, moved there. Uh, she learned so much, and and so it wasn't so much about her her work, but it gave me a sense of like this is a person who is. Uh, who's brave, you know, she, uh, she had never flown outside of the US and she tried something new. She was open to other cultures. She was curious and, you know, and like those things in her work would be reflected too. So, so again, like have a think about your story. It could be like a little detail, something from your childhood, whatever it is, um, and work that built that story up to make you, um, you know, to make you more unique. So these are just like very practical things. Make a list of like the recruiters, uh, if you know any of the people you know who have 
contacts, you know, just start building your network. I know out of school, the, the network is going to be pretty small, but as you sort of progress, it's going to get bigger. Uh, always make a list. It could be a list of like a, a studios, agencies you would love to work uh, for, you know, it could be your, your dream list, but make the list because, um, you know, anything's possible, you know, all the options are open. Be flexible. Um, I, I usually like to make a list of like three things that are really important for me when looking for a job. The first thing is I have to love the person I'm going to report to. I have to have good chemistry with that person. It's really important for me. And I've said no to a jobs when like, I didn't have that in, in place. Um, I, for me, uh, having a, um, an environment where they're open to change. You know, I, as a designer, I like finding problems and fixing them. So um, any, like a, a non-perfect place, I don't wanna go to a place where like everything's amazing and there's nothing to fix. Cause I, I would feel like, what's my, what's my purpose? What am I, what am I gonna bring to the table, right? But, but as a young student, I think be a little flexible, um, know what you want, but be flexible because you know the most important is that you put, get a foot in the door, find a job, um, learn from it. If you love it, great, you know, continue uh, building there. If you hate it, start looking for something else after six months, a year. Don't leave after like two weeks. <laughs> um, get noticed. I will, well, I'll show you uh, some examples of that. And then, yeah, again, work your network. It starts small and grows bigger as you, as you move forward. So get noticed. This is an example of this. It's, it's an old example, but I, I thought it was so smart. It's in the 70s. Um, this is a professor who's now a professor in New York at uh, the School of Visual Arts. His name is Kevin, Kevin O'Callaghan. And he had, in the 70s, he had a, a, an appointment, you know, a meeting with Milton Glaser, who's a fantastic, you know, um, a designer. He was very nervous and he really thought about like how he would show up for that um, for that interview and how he would show his work and his portfolio. And so he's, he built this like larger than life physical portfolio. They you know, still did that back in the days. There was no internet. Um, and he, he sort of pulled that uh, with his car that he went through the, 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 the tunnel uh, in New York and he was able to figure out the height of the tunnel to make sure they wouldn't break. But, uh, and then he opened it up at the parking lot, had Milton Blazer come down. Of course he got the job. But it also got a lot of press around his performance, and it started building. And this is a story that you know, like years and years later, he still tells uh, because it was sort of the defining moment in his career where he just started. Again, he was a student, you know, and but he he stood out from the rest. So I think about how you know you again. It's going to be a lot of competition out there, uh, fellow students looking for jobs. Like, how are you going to show? yourself in the best light. I have this other example. Uh, so let me uh, explain it before I, I play it. It's a video that was shared uh, to me by, I think a recruiter friend. And she said, you have to watch this video. It's amazing. It's this girl out of school who did a video where she asked her mom to sell her. And she's Puerto Rican. Her mom doesn't speak very good English, but it's hilarious. Um, and she, after, uh, and this video has traveled in every agency in New York. Everybody saw it. She found a cool job. Um, I think she's at Fred and Farid now in New York. Um, and it just showed that, you know, a very small budget. She did it at home, you know, filled it with her mom. Let me just play it. This order of Cindy Horizons, and I'm going to uh, explain to you in a little time how my daughter is a very, very happy girl and angry and smart. And she wants to give you the whole she has in his brain. And she is very, very, very has very good ideas. I don't know where to take it every to this idea. She's like a powerful spring and has a lot of idea and very good ideas. Sometimes I uh, suppose uh, this is my daughter. <laughs> it. All right. And I want to tell you, she always has it. And she likes to be to help the oldest persons. She always, you know, and pay attention to has every work very good she is attending to every work have it on time for you and very fast and a very good job and always happy and go together always happy 
okay? Happy face is a very good every time, okay? Enjoy her okay? Thank you. She was hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, the other thing, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is really important. Uh, you know, it's a professional network. Uh, there are many ways to leverage LinkedIn. First, of course, build a, a paid profile. Um, one of the things, again, I learned very late in life is you have to own your domain name. You know, buy it, purchase it, own your name. Um, your portfolio should not be on like Behance.com com slash your name it should be on like natalie huni dot whatever um it's important for your google results you'll you'll see that's one of the reasons why when i got married i didn't change my last name because i had so many <laughs> google results from years and years i was not going to give that up um one of the things on linkedin which uh i've started seeing people use is what we call the the headline so the headline is a little line underneath your name. And, you know, most of times people just put their, their title there, you know, whatever their current title is. But in this idea of starting to build your story and build your, your, um, your brand, right, as a creative, uh, people are now using this headline space to um, write what they're about or what they care for or what is something like something special about them. Um, Cindy Gallup, who is a creative veteran, you know, she, she's been in the industry for years. Now she's, she's an entrepreneur. She's, a, she's founded so many businesses. She, um, so her headline is, I like to blow shit up. I am the Michael Bay of business. And it's really true to her brand as a person, you know, it's, it's sort of this like one liner that if you are in a party, somebody talks about you, they would say like, hey, do you know Cindy Gallup? She's the, you know, she's the Michael Bay of business. What's that one liner that's gonna um, represent who you are? Because your headline in LinkedIn, when you comment and when you post, follows you everywhere. It's another way to get you noticed. So again, like Tiffany Rolf, who's the, you know, the chief creative officer at RGA um, globally, she added in, and we see this more and more now, you know, there's been so much conversation about like showing uh, other women that you can be a mom and you can be a, you know, a, prof a professional leader. Um, she added mom first, which I thought is really nice, which I actually copied, to be honest, uh, and added in my title. But I, I also added uh, the where I came from. It was for me, it was really important that I'm like half Filipino, half French, you know, and having this international space there. Um, in this day and age, again, like this is this, the fact that I'm a mom and I'm, I had design, that's kind of where, you know, how I represent this balance of me. So I just have a think about it. Social, um, Instagram, you know, wherever you're showing up on social people will, if your profile is open, they will check it. Will, they want to, I always, you know, I, before I hire anybody, I always see if, they, you know, how they show up just to get a sense of their personality. So just make sure that it, whatever you show is something you want, you know, the professional people in your life to see, because they, you know, it will represent you, it will follow you everywhere. Um, and then, you know, again, very quickly, when you get to the actual interview, um, this may be very American and it's something I had to uh evolve when i got here you know americans are overly optimistic which is sometimes a little annoying um, when you're european but i think the balance of optimism and like uh realness uh is important to try to find right the the how um how you're gonna sell yourself how are you gonna show show up again just remember the the person on the other side is looking for some you know somebody who they want to work with so showing yourself in your best light um, is important. Your setup, you know, what's in the background. I've had like interviews where I'm like, where are you? Are you in your kitchen, in your bathroom? Like the lighting's horrible. I, I, I because we're, you know, we're doing these interviews right now on Zoom, um, you know, online. You can use the back, your background as a, another way of showing your personality. So just like putting up, you know, a cool poster or something you like you know it's a, just a conversation starter that you can talk about your environment but that is an extension of you know of who you are uh, practice your story and delivery practice on yourself record yourself presenting 
um, uh, present to somebody else. The more you start, start telling your story, the more comfortable you'll be with, uh, with it. Um, I personally was a, you know, I, I grew up as an introvert as a lot of designers are. And so it was really, really scary for me to interview and talk and even like talk in front of like a lot of people. It took me years to do. Uh, but the more I did it, the more comfortable I was doing it. Um, so I, you know, start early. It'll be less painful later. Uh, and then this one, I always say this, tell a story of what they don't see. Often when we're showing creative, we have a tendency to describe what they see on, on you know, on the, on the work. Uh, don't do that because it's it's just a waste of time. We already see it. So I think you have to explain everything else. Explain the process behind how you got there. Explain um, if it's if there's animation intended, but you're watching something that's static. Explain the how things move together. Like explain everything that is not shown on the screen, right? And then you can follow up after an interview just to make sure you know that say thank you for the time and you know looking forward to moving forward. And then you know fingers crossed uh, that works. Okay, so that's kind of the, the 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 beginning, you know, how to get how to get um, a foot in the door and get a, a job you, you hopefully will not hate. Um, so the middle part, congratulations, you landed your first job, um, and uh, let's see how that that sort of shapes up in the couple of years uh, moving forward. So one of the things I try to keep in mind, and I always tell my creatives, you are only as good as your last piece of work. So it's a little bit of a tension there because you can't sort of rest on your laurels and say, oh, I did something great like two years ago, you know, like I'm just gonna stay there. As a creative, you're constantly a uh, uh, work in progress. Me, even after 25 years, I'm still designing, I'm still learning, I'm still evolving. And I, I judge my worth, my value on the last piece of work I've done. So it's a little scary and it's a little stressful, but um, you know, I, and I think that's why it's so hard to be creative is that there is this constant search for better. Um, I'll do whatever you did last time. Um, so, so again, it shouldn't be something stressful, but something to just re re remember, um, we are all a work in progress. We're, we're all in evolution and it should be an evolution that's moving forward, not, back, not backwards. Um, I, have this, I, I have this rule that I share with the sort of young, uh, out of school creatives, the, the five year rule um, is that, you know, whether you land a job or you stay in a job for the first five years or you decide to move, it's uh, two things. One, it's important that you don't chase only, only chase the money. Don't pick a job because it pays better. Really think about like the value of what that, um, uh, that job is gonna offer you, the opportunities to work on something interesting, to build up your portfolio, right? Um, you can, because if you, if you do that, you will have more value in your book, in your portfolio, um, and the rise to more, you know, better pay, more important titles will come with a solid foundation. What's going to happen if you just chase the money is that after five years, you will have nothing to show for it and you're going to be stuck. So again, something very valuable that I've learned. The other thing is, um, not just the money, but uh, you know, like the first five years, I think if you're in a, in a, a position, an agency, a studio where you don't, you're not learning anything, move. You have five years to try to do as many different things as you, as you can um, and experience as many different things. Try a small studio, try a big agency, try like different things. You don't know what you're gonna like, right? And so you have five years to get a taste of as much as you can, as, as many you know, different projects as you, as you can get your hands on. Um, I always say that uh, you know, work is like dating. You don't know until you know, and so you have to try a, a lot of different um, places. Um, I've worked in like tiny studios with like three people. I've worked with giant and giant agencies. I've worked in different countries. I've worked in different places. And the more I try different places, the more not necessarily I knew what I wanted, where I wanted to go, but I knew what I didn't like and what I didn't want to do again. And so as I move forward, it got easier and easier because there, there were just like the more precise choices. You have to update your portfolio every single year. If you look back uh, and fix yourself a date, it could be you know every December, look back at everything you've done 
in the year, if you have nothing to update your work with, it's not a good, it's not a good sign. It means you haven't, um, you haven't evolved, you haven't uh, gotten a chance to, tr uh, to work on improving yourself. And so if the agency you're at doesn't um, offer that for you, it's, it's probably a sign for you to move, find something else. Um, and I always say interview when you don't need to. Keep interviewing, even if you're very happy at the place you're at, because it's, you have nothing to lose, it's practice. It's practice of you presenting your work, knowing what's out there. If you know what's out there and you decide to stay, it's not because you're scared of moving, it's because you know, you're confident in the place you're at that it's giving you everything um, you need. And then this, you know, I think nobody's really talked uh, to me about this, but there are days where it's gonna be awesome. You're gonna feel like you're killing it. You'll love the place you're at. It would, you know, you'll, you'll be so proud of the work you've done. It's gonna be fantastic. The highs are gonna be great, but they're also gonna be really bad days where it could be the place you're at. It just feels like everything's on fire and you're like, ah, I'm unhappy here. Or you could get, you know, uh, laid off, fired. These things happen. And what I, what I can tell you is I have, you know, I've talked to many, many very successful people in the industry and they have all had very similar, you know, different stories, but they've all gone through great and horrible moments. And it's normal in a career to have that, you know, regardless of how successful you are, they're going to be like low moments and, um it's okay it doesn't mean you're bad it doesn't mean you're worthless it just means you know you're trying different things you've taken risks and it will get better just move on um move forward uh, but it's not a it's not a unique thing and the more i've heard it the more it sort of made me feel better about when that happens to you right you're not it's not a, a it's not a sign of failure and then, you know, reaching the top, and I, I don't want to call it the end because it's not the end really. It's really about like accumulating a lot of experience um, and work. Um, so let's imagine this fast forward, maybe 15 or 20 years, maybe it's shorter, shorter you know, depending on, but this is sort of where uh, I was. And, you know, you've gone through different places, maybe you've moved around a bit, um, different, uh, different uh, agency uh, structures. Maybe you've won, uh, you again, a bunch of awards. Not that it's again, you know, the, the most important thing in the world. Maybe you've been published in different places. Anyway, you've 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 amassed experiences um, and a range of work that you're just, you know, you can look back on and say, uh, I'm really proud of this, the things I've done or the 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 places I've been to, the things I've built, right? Um, my output, like the things that I personally feel like I have gained from all of this experience. The first one is confidence. You know, again, I told you as, a, as I started as a young designer, I was so, so, so introvert. I was so scared of talking. Of, I, you know, I always felt like I was an imposter in a lot of situations, a lot of like roles in my life. You know, I would say yes to things, but I was like, oh, can I really do it? I, do I know enough? Probably not. I think now, you know, I, I don't second guess myself anymore. I just have the confidence of knowing, even if I don't know, I'm, I know I'm gonna figure it out. I know it's gonna work out. I know I'm gonna make it happen. It takes time to build that confidence and the confidence comes with um, how you also uh, uh, react to failure. Like failure is a really important thing in our industry. Failure and then you know, being able to like put a knee up and stand up and move forward, that builds confidence and strength and um, Again, it, you know, some people might have the appearance of confidence in the beginning, but I really do think it, you know, it, it comes with experience. Um, so that's a great thing to, to look forward to having more of. Um, the other thing I think is empathy. I think, you know, as young designers and young creatives, you kind of, you know, it's each person for themselves. You, you think about like, um, you know, winning and striving and being the best. Um, but with, with time, um, there are better ways to like help others rise with you. You know, it's not you or the, the others, you can rise as, as a group. And the, the, the understanding of like leading with empathy was something that really actually helped me a lot as a sort of a, a very senior leader in the teams, 
not only with like younger creatives, but also older creatives, you know? Um, it, it felt like a really powerful tool to have that I wish I had maybe a little bit um, earlier in my career. And then the last thing is, you know, what I was telling Maggie, I, I want to start doing more of is uh, sharing things I've learned um, just to, uh, you know, to want to grow talent, um, to leave a, a legacy behind and just feel like I can empower more, um, more people out there. You know, we spend so much time working for clients and brands and, you know, um, the more sort of capitalistic aspect, you know, at, at the end of the day, design is, to, is, you know, exploitation of our creative sense to sell more stuff, you know, uh, but um, it's very fulfilling to um, spend time. You know, I wish we could, could be in the same room rather than just like virtual um, thing where, I, you know, I could spend time and, and grow, uh, grow talent and uh, mentor. But this is something, again, I think to really look forward to, it, it's so um, fulfilling to be able to, to, to do that. So just as a sort of the wrap up here, you know, life and I think your professional, you know, journey is is just that it is a journey right that whether you're day one um middle or towards the, the the top of the journey um and i think sometimes we forget we're always thinking about like next step next job next role you know i want to go up the ladder but the journey itself you know with its high and its lows and all the little joys like i would i would um i would tell you enjoy the the journey um because it's really rewarding all the little things you will accomplish you will um you will learn all the people you will meet and things you will build along the way actually that is the reward of you know what we're doing as creatives um i think you know sometimes we have a tendency to forget that and just focus on like the stress of you know a deadline to um deliver on but it's we're still have we're still really lucky to be doing a, you know working in a creative field um so just you know being able to um just enjoy enjoy the journey you know um the good and the bad and everything in between and that's it that's all i have for you so i'm i i, I would love to hear you know any anything you you want to ask me there are no stupid questions um yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna give them a minute to yeah. to, uh, to brief their question and to prepare them. I hope there'll be a, a lot. Um, Natalie, thank you. That was like an amazing life coaching session. Actually, it was, <laughs> it was really life coach, coaching, which was actually what I was hoping for. And you gave me so much confidence because, like last week, I actually showed students a very similar um, situation as um, the artist that was meeting Milton Glaser. I forgot his name, but I, I actually oh Kevin and Callahan. Yeah, yeah, I put down Gavin Strange because he he did a, a very similar concept where he made a huge um, foot, which he, you know, how can I put my foot in the door? Ask it like, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. So our mindset is so similar and all of the, the wonderful advice you gave, even if I don't have even half of your experience. I mean, I'm, I'm really happy that it's really like that because um, everything you, you really, you always think that there are like deep, dark secrets in the, in the industry, like every year, every uh, added year you go there and you think that it's all a mystery. But actually I think um, that's something I, I also tell students, I'm the, you know, the old stereotype from the seventies that us designers or artists are like silent people sitting in corners with, with you know, black sweaters and waiting for a, to be appraised is, is not really, um, not really legit anymore. So we really have to know how to communicate. And that's something I think here at the university, even, even though Belgrade is a much smaller market, um, which is really cool because people in the design industry here are really open and it's much easier to swim, you know, with the sharks yeah, yeah, yeah. for less of us. And most of the people are pretty cool. I mean, design-based. Okay. <laughs> Marketing, okay, it's like half-half. So I think communication, hanging out, meeting at, you know, festivals and, or gallery openings is really important um you know to put actually their foot in in each doors another thing i would i would really um also like 
want to, to say at, at the same time. Um, I mean, it's so the, the empathy part of, part of the, the experience of designing. I think empathy is the only, the, the tool, it's the, the, the tool that's the only component that is putting us apart from robots to, for, to taking, taking our jobs away from us. You know, it's because we're humans and we design for humans. So um, our students are really fantastic. They really get that on time. So I really, I really um, think these, this kind of advice, especially when they hear it from someone like you, that's like designed the whole world. I have one question and then maybe yeah. it's gonna make them a bit, um, they, they, they can see how freely they can go. Um, and it's probably absurd, but it is the first I, I think to mind. Um, I would say that you're actually an experienced designer because I, I also have a lecture just about experience design. It's totally, that it's a very um, cloudy definition, but you know, you design experiences. So it's yep. not product, it's not marketing based, or it's just having good or bad experiences with design. If you could, after so many years, um, like dream up a situation, like you're, you're the most, the most romantic or, or dreamy gig or job you would have, like it could be anything. Do you do you have some kind of um, impression what it would be? Oh God! I know it's it's a totally it's absurd. hard. It's hard. It could be so many things. I've actually thought about it recently. Um, I so one of them actually I have a client uh, where I do a lot of work. It's mostly marketing mm -hmm. around uh, the feminine care journey. So you know, so it's a it's Playtex, it's a, uh, tampons, pads, you know, all that all the period stuff. And so we do a lot of work across like young women first period all the way to menopause right that full journey of women it's so interesting we've done so much research and the more i dig into it the more i think as a mom as a woman as a mom of like uh teenagers um it's a place where there is so much uh suffering yeah and also people don't feel alone people don't talk there's so much you know um things to unlock mm -hmm. so i i if i could so that's one thing that that space you know um around women and um uh, um sort of i don't know if it's unlocking experiences but like working through that whole journey uh i just think it's so exciting the other one would be kids working with like on education um for kids that's just again like, there's so much to do there uh, but it could be really be anything uh, except finance. I really hate yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like in a way, not socially engaged, but yeah, I'm I'm actually locally doing a a, 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 a projects about actually tampons and and ah. you know we're communicating with young girls and it's something that you know it's never ending. It's two years on going and it's, yeah, it's just you just get all ideas every day and then you. <laughs> you, you know, delete all the other ones. So that, you know, we're gonna leave that conversation yeah, for yeah, you yeah. and me. Okay, uh, guys, you can you can butt in and, and uh, ask questions, feel free. I would like to ask, uh, usually, uh, where do you find an um, inspiration? Uh, hi. Um, I think uh, it depends. I have a, lots of different places. Um, I think a lot, you know, just sort of uh, connecting with what's happening in sort of culture in general. So you know, news outlets and uh, magazines, and um, a lot of a lot on social, a lot recently on TikTok because that's where like people mm -hmm. share so much, and also a lot of our communication um, for some of our clients are on TikTok, so there's a lot sort of, you know, I, I go there just more as a, a browser than a, a content creator. Um, I think it depends on the, the actual subject, you know, so um, working on um, brands, I'm thinking of like, I'm working on this project, for example, uh, for Visa, where a lot of the work is around like, inclusion and divert, like being a platform that is open to all people, all walks of life. So there's a lot of uh, research, uh, you know, I need to do about like uh, culture and about also about like uh, inclusive design. Mm -hmm. 
um, how to push design to be more inclusive for all sorts of like abilities. Um, and so I, I, I think I try to, my, like my sensor is always on, you know, I try to go to as many sort of photo exhibits, museums, you know, anything that's, um, will, um, uh, I can sort of inspire, uh, aspire. And, um, I think what happens when you sort of just like try to, uh, get as much inspiration from different places is that at some point in your brain, uh, it connects different pieces together that you would not necessarily would have thought about. Um, so, so I try to be as vast as possible because I work on so many different um, subjects at the same time. You know, I usually have like eight different clients and they're all super different. So I can't sort of focus on one thing more than the other, but I would try to get as many experiences, not necessarily all online, which is, you know, right now a little bit harder. Uh, but could be podcasts also, you know, it doesn't have to be all sort of visual things, but yeah, I try to, try to, you know, be open to as much as I can. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. helpful. And I have the second uh, question. Uh, your work is an uh, inspiration for many people and you are an idol for many people and young designers too. So uh, who is your idol? <laughs> What, sorry? What was Who's the your idol? Because Who's my idol. Oh, um, so it's funny because I did this ex this uh, experience not so this exercise not so long ago. I was writing a vision board of like where I want to go, and in there I had to put three uh, three people I uh, look up to. Mm -hmm. I really thought about it, and I. Um, strangely it was there were there were all guys i don't know why I, it wasn't like a conscious decision but there were no women in my like my three examples the first one shit i forgot his name but he's the he's the the founder and the ceo of this uh, uh yogurt brand in the u.s called chobani i don't know if you if you heard of it but his story I, I saw his story through a ted talk which i thought was so inspiring i'll make it short but basically He's, you know, like a fin financial guy. And he, one day he found a factory in the north of New York, which was a yogurt factory, which was, you know, very old school. They were going to close the place, fire everybody. And he decided to come in and transform the, you know, he bought it. He transformed the business from like just regular yogurt to Greek yogurt. He, you know, sort of marketed that as a new thing in the market here. Uh, and he kept all of the old employees. He trained them. He gave them like shares um, at the beginning of the project. Um, and it grew to be one of the most successful yogurt, uh, Greek yogurt brands in the US. It's huge now, it's ginormous. Mm -hmm. But I really like the story of the fact that he didn't, he took on the current team, trained them, inspired them. Like, you know, they were, they had been working for the factory for like many, many years. And I think that act of empathy uh, for me, was like a really good example of a good leader. Mm -hmm. uh, the cycle, second example, which, which I think is a little funny, but uh, bear bear with me for a second, is in fashion, Olivier Roustin, uh, who is the creative director for Balmain. And I don't know if you were able to see, he, you know, he has a really interesting story. He was, you know, he was adopted um, in France and he doesn't know his biological parents, but there was a documentary about his, you know, his sort of search for his, uh, biological parents, um, and his story there. And he was never able to find it, but the fact that he was, uh, he shared that story that's so, so personal, you know, you could see him like breaking down in tears, but that he shared that story so personal to the entire world, uh, I think was, uh, like a great act of, uh, courage and strength um, that I thought, you know, again, he's like at the top of the, he doesn't need to do all of this. He's already like a, you know, a rock star in the fashion uh, business. He, he was so different from everything else we've known in the past in fashion that I thought like, that's, that's a great, lead. like, I, I was trying to imagine the people who worked under him, how much more they would like him because he was strong enough to share his weakness. Um, so those are again like two examples. I'm trying to think of who the third one was. I can't remember. But two examples. Oh, the third one was a, a Japanese, um, actually CCO in New York, who actually became my mentor. And I, I really, really like him. You know, he um, he's somebody I interviewed with years ago. He used to be the, the chief creative officer of AKQA, 
And he was the first example I had of an Asian leader uh, who was uh, somebody who was so respected, but the way he, um, the, when he talked, when he presented work, when he um, you know, held conferences, he was so soft-spoken, but he was so um, smart and in control of his speech that everybody listened to him. And it was the first time I saw an example of a leader who wasn't, who wasn't necessarily like the stereotypical uh, macho uh, leader that we're used to seeing in the advertising industry. He was much more empathetic. He was much more, uh, you know, he would listen to others. He would let others speak first. Um, and for me, it was like, it was kind of a, a revelation that there are other types of leaders out there um, who are not, you know, just the, what we're used to seeing um, in the space. So yeah, those three. Mm -hmm. Okay. And my last question <laughs> definitely is uh, from the point, uh, where are you now? Where do you see yourself in uh, five years, maybe? In five years? Uh, in five years, um, I think there, there, there could be two paths. Um, one is I could continue to go up the ladder, right? I am head of design. My next logical role would be to be a CCO of a, like a big network. Um, and I have a personal conflict in the two paths. The first one is I could go up the ladder. The higher you go um, in terms of like a career ladder, the further away you are from the stuff you love. You're, the, you're far away from the actual work, you know? Which I, I love, you know, spending time with the creatives and, you know, helping them sh sh shape the work. The higher you go, the more you're into politics, politics of the network. And, um, and I don't know if I want to do that. That's my conflict right now. My other um, uh, direction could be I could decide to go smaller, a smaller place where I lead an agency rather than a network. I lead a smaller agency that I can grow, I can really shape and I have much more control over like the culture, the work, the people. Um, and I am right now, I'm kind of still thinking about it. What's the one could make me more happy. The other one has more money. And I, I, I don't know. It's complicated because it depends, you know, I think, you know, again, like I'm in the US, everything's so expensive. I have like four kids, I have to pay through college. So like the logical one would be, yes, take the bigger one that you don't, you, that will make you less happy. And the equation, the additional layer in the equation is, depends on, on the job my husband will take. Because if he can take something he hates, then I can take something I love. <laughs> and so I don't know yet. I have, I have to, I have to be a little patient and wait. Yeah. Roll the dice. <laughs> Roll the dice, yeah, yeah. I see some other students. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I see some students connecting to audio, so maybe they're trying to, to connect because they're all muted. They were muted. Um, I, uh, while we're waiting, I just had another question come, come to mind. Mm -hmm. I, as I remember, and by my research, Natalie, were you um, ever focused a bit more on print or are you in digital like for many years now? Yeah. Actually, I remember in Paris when you were working on some, something that was like going to print, but. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I still do print. It's just that right now that, you know, the, in the, when we work on campaigns. No, it's actually a part of, of, of course. Yeah, there's just less print than there was before. Like nobody buys magazines anymore, you know, it's so rare. Uh, so we do a little bit of outdoor, mm. you know, we've done like the last campaign I've done, we have some wild postings, you know, in the streets of New York, like posters. Um, but there really isn't a lot of yeah, that's, print. That's I mean, I, that's yeah, I've, I've done actually for the, for the, uh, for Playtex, we did packaging. Mm -hmm. their, their newest packaging that's launching next year. Uh, but I, I would say most of the work is either um, platforms or services, you know, websites, apps, um, that sort of thing, or on the other side, it's like digital campaigns. A lot of, we do a ton of like campaigns on TikTok. So and you do copyright as well. You're in the team for like yeah, in my team, so I have designers, I have art directors, I have UI, UX, mm -hmm. and depending on the project, right, I, we sort of cast the right the right teams uh, across that, yeah. Cool. Cool. 
Okay, someone else, you can um, butt in and stop us talking, feel free. <laughs> Don't ask me questions tomorrow on our, on our um, routine classes. Um, I, I have a couple of questions, if I may. Yes. Sure. Well, hello, first of all, it's a pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you. So the first thing I would like to address is that in the beginning, you said that you have 25 years of experience, which is amazing because we here barely have 25 years of existence. <laughs> so listening to you is really like such an honor. Thank you. I've noticed that in the um, portfolios that you have provided as examples in your presentation, yep. um, your candidates had photos of themselves. Yep. And I'm currently a little bit lost because I was looking up on YouTube, like different CEOs and people who go through tons of portfolios every day. Um, they, most of them actually said that a photo is not necessary unless someone is an actor or a model or something like that. And since I'm personally planning to work behind the scenes, like uh, I, I'm a student of the fourth year of video game design, I would like to be a writer or a level designer. Like my face wouldn't really be necessary. So should I include yeah. it in my CV or? Yeah, so I think there's a difference between like your CV and your, port your online portfolio. Um, I think whatever you're comfortable with, right? I think on CV, you don't have to have a photo. Uh, I don't think there's any like hard rules on yes or no. If you want to put, I have one on my CV, but um, just because I, I like my photo, but <laughs> some people don't. It does, I think the CV doesn't matter so much. On the about page, again, you don't have to have your photo. I think it's a nice to have. Um, maybe it depends on, you know, it's not about like what you're, whether you're going to be in front of or behind the camera. It's more like the people who are recruiting you, they want to uh, get a sense of who you are or else it's a little bit um, abstract, right? It's just words on a page. Um, I like to have a, as much of a feel before I actually contact the candidate to have a, you know, a, a discussion to get a feel of who this person is. And um, I can get a little bit out of that from the image. Again, whatever you're feel, you feel comfortable with, um, but it's nice to have. But I, you know, I have recruited people who have no foot, no. There's no like hard rule on that. Um, if that's if that's helpful. Yeah, it is because I kind of have a personal. It's not a personal issue. It's just judgment from people because I happen to be alternative, um, and people judge me based on what they see, thinking that I'm like bad person but I'm really not I promise so that that's why I asked I was a little bit confused because mo most people when they see someone with piercings and dyed hair they don't really form a good opinion yeah we're firsthand. talking we're talking to Natalie which lives in New York so <laughs> yeah, yeah it's kind of different there of yeah, course yeah, oh, she understands. For sure. I mean I think you know again we're working in the creative field so if they have like problems with something as simple as you know piercings or tattoos or whatever you don't want to work and it's probably not a place where you want to yeah. you know work in or people you want to work with I I would you know again whatever you feel comfortable with but I would always recommend just showing up as yourself you know because they're going to work with you at some point. They will, you know, meet you, find, you know, find out who you are. So might as well be upfront um, in the beginning. And one I think, more I think that my point oh, is like you're, you're, you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. And so there just has to be good chemistry between both sides, right? Mm -hmm. And one more question is about... Um, primary and secondary skills. How often do you come across people that don't put any secondary skills on their CVs or applications? How important is that? Give me an example, like what, for example? Uh, well, I do have my set of primary skills where let's say I want to be a writer and focus on that. But okay. I also am kind of good in some things like, let's say that I can pick up 3D modeling and yep. I can put it on my CV and yeah, I can do it, but like 10 years into the future, I don't see myself as doing particularly only that. Yeah. Like I would like to advance in my field, which is writing and creating yeah. things like that. But apart from that, I have some experience in some other things. Yeah, I think it's fine to put it honestly, you know, again, like people know you're out of, you know, out of school, they don't expect you to be you know, like masters and everything yet, but it just shows that, you know, this is, this is where you're at. 
Um, and as you're moving forward, uh, you know, every year you can sort of tweak your, your CV to reflect best where you're at and where you're going and, you know, what you want to do. A CV is only good for, you know, for like a year. Um, and then after you, you have, you will have evolved and you will have to change it. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, it, it does. Thank you very much. I, I, I talk to, to Dushan and, and his colleagues every week and it's so dif difficult to, you know, um, focus a whole semester and creating a portfolio. Of course, you need even more time, but it's actually very introspective because it's a moment where they actually have to ask themselves a lot of questions where you can't really, as you say, uh, define some hard hard rules. I mean, that would be much easier for all yeah. of us when we were- But then everybody would be the same, right? Yeah. yeah. So Natalie and me, I also like to incorporate photographs, but it's such some something very personal. So yeah. For like that's one of one of the issues. There are like 30, 50 questions that I ask myself, like whether to um, give advice to do or not to do in creating portfolios. Of course, you know, try to um, close your eyes toward the trends and stuff. That's very, that's very. Um, yeah, sad. sometimes I see portfolios with like it's not necessarily a picture of the person. It could be a picture of something they that represents them. You oh. know, that's fine too. It's just an additional sort of visual cue to get a sense of like who this person is. Because you know, again, it's very impersonal, right? Uh, uh, just to get like a, a CV or a a write up without. Yeah, we're we're visual people. I think that yeah. we remember things visually. Exactly. It's more exactly. because you yeah. see words on a page, but actually that's all. Because I, I'm sure that a lot of students and because they're here, they're listening to you. So it's something that's very a topic that's very attractive to them. So they're reading a lot of um, articles or listening to talks about portfolios. And you can really, because I did my research, you hear absolutely and everything. So many different opinions. Oh. Yeah, pick I think pick whatever you want to you know you to pick, pick your own yeah, yeah pick your own thing yeah, uh, anyway rules are meant to be broken you know exactly yeah <laughs> you're gonna be a great teacher huh? <laughs> okay and, someone else so we can wrap it up natalie has to work <laughs> she has to be a boss to a lot of people <laughs> anyone else no are you sure it's a very very special Special opportunity. Nope. Yes. I have like 20 more questions, but I think I'm going to just send her a mail. <laughs> okay. So if no one's going to, um, going to stop me or, or, but, um, it's like say, say they have something to add. I'm going to thank Natalie in, in the name of the Metropolitan University and all of us here today. And, uh, you know, I think all of the students, you, are, you were actually so, um, so the experience of your, of your lecture was so friendly and informative that I can understand why they can't force a question out. It was, you just, <laughs> all, yeah, I, I get it. But um, no, it's, it's, a, it's absolutely so much more productive to hear something like this from someone like you you know, then what they hear once or twice a week, you know, in the form of, of uh, the boring lectures that we, that no, we, I don't say uh, that. No, no, we're, we're trying our <laughs> best, but it's, it's, it's a, it's a big deal. So thank you so much. Thank God, all of the students, you guys, you can find Natalie, Natalie via, um, you know, all of the, all of the networks online. She's there. You can, um, you can absolutely follow what she's doing and, I, my huge wish is that she, she could visit us, you know, in the next couple of months or a year or so, so we can get her here physically and hopefully we're going to forget all of this, uh, the, this party and we're going to be, um, you know, ready to, to see her live and, and we could welcome her at our university. Some of you guys are going to be, you know, in the marketplace then, some of you guys aren't, they're going to be still students here, so we'll see. But thank you so much, Natalie. This was thanks so much for having fantastic. me. Fantastic. Yeah, we wish yeah. you a, a productive day because uh, it's thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're here, you know, near dinner time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the students. And um Nat, I'll I'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye guys.